And everybody, um, so we just thought of kind of a fun idea to keep people interacted and, and uh, you know, the club's based on obviously a couple things on fellowship and, uh, um, and education, right? So um, when you think about that, you think about going to college, right? And I, um, you know, that's kind of the name of the deal why we started, the, did the Rabbit 101, just kind of a college type theme. And frankly, what's pretty cool that <clears throat> right in our backyard in Stephenville, <clears throat> um, in fact, uh, Brandon, so I'd like a little background, but I, uh, um, I did a Google search to find out the number of colleges in the U.S. that have rabbit trees. And frankly, I could not find any um, <laughs> other than Tarleton. So I, uh, I think that's a, you know, we're really, frankly, it's pretty cool that right in our backyard, we've got a, a, a nice university that's got a, a, a college rabbit tree. So um, we talked and, and messaged back and forth and we're just really, really uh, pleased to have uh, Brandon Smith, Dr. Brandon Smith, uh, to give us a little background on what goes what happens at the Tarleton rabbit tree. And uh, we appreciate your time this evening. So Brandon, we're gonna turn it over to you. Okay. And I guess I'll, I'll on one regard, we'll get started before we get started. If everybody can maybe can maybe mute their their um, their Zoom here, their computers. But we do want if there's questions, obviously uh, unmute and ask a question if that's okay with you, Brandon. So oh, that's perfectly um, fine. Uh, can you turn um, on the screen share? And so I've got I put a lot of pictures and a slideshow that I can add in with us. Fantastic, fantastic. So the floor is yours. So. All right, can you enable the screen sharing for me? Tammy, do you do that on your end? Uh, I can make him a host. Let's see, because I can see the screen share, but let's make uh, make sure Brandon's a host. Let's see. Oh, I, see oh, the I can't do it anymore because you're the host now, John. So <laughs> How do click, I? Can I? You click next to his name on the three little dots where it says more. Yeah. You should be able to give him the screen. I'm going to put make host. Okay. Yes, you can do that. Perfect. I got it. Yep. So Brandon, you are now the host. So there yep. we go. Okay. I promise not to do anything too funky. <laughs> All right. Well, let's make it fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have fun for sure. I'm, I've got no issue with that. So let's see here. Let's just go to screen three. There we go. I think my slide shows up now. Is it looking good, John? It is. Absolutely. All right. All right. So, John, I appreciate the invite and I appreciate the introduction. So, my name is Brandon Smith and forget the doctor thing. That just means that I was too stupid to quit going to school for too many years. That's, that's about all that title means. But John invited me a few weeks back. We connected through Facebook and asked me if I would be interested in coming in, telling a little about myself, telling a little about what we do here at Tarleton. So I put this together. Hopefully it's informative and anytime during this, stop me, ask me a question, tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I'm open to any of it. So I want to start with a little background on me. Uh, what, what am I, where have I come from? How did I get here? I am not a Texas native by any stretch of the imagination, nor am I a seasoned rabbit breeder. So I grew up in Southeast Alabama raising beef cattle, a very small operation in Southeast Alabama. My background is not in rabbits. My background is not in a whole lot of anything, to be completely honest with you. We, we were small enough that it was just a hobby farm. It was something on the side. Um, I've got degrees all over the board. So I attended Auburn University. I'm, I got degrees in agronomy and soils, so crops and soils. Got a degree in animal sciences. I went on to the University of Arkansas, got a degree in ruminant nutrition, so specializing in cattle and sheep, and then finished up at Texas A&M with a degree in agronomy. So I went back to the crop side looking at grasses. Uh, that's how I figured out about Tarleton. I had never heard of Tarleton or Stephenville, Texas till I got to Texas A&M. And turns out that one of my professors that taught me when I was at Auburn became the department head here at Stephenville. So when a position came open, he shot me a message said, we'd like for you to apply. And I said, absolutely, please. I, I'd like a job and I'd like gainful employment. So that's what got me here. What you're more interested in though is the rabbitry. 
So how did we get our start? I start out within the beginning. Like I said, I have no background in raising rabbits. I had never been around them. Can't say that I had even really handled one until we started this operation. I'm a trained animal nutritionist. And my job when I got here was to teach students about animal nutrition. That was the name of the game. I took over the animal nutrition course. What I wanted to do when I got in that course was make sure that I did not show favoritism to any one species. I wanted to make sure that I covered everything across the board and the students were getting everything they could, which means that rabbits came into my discussion. It was something that we didn't study a lot when I was in school, but I wanted to make sure our students got it. And that kind of planted the seed in my head. The more I would teach about it, the more semesters we would go through talking about it, the more interested I became. And you, you start teaching about digestive systems and the ins and outs of some of the peculiarities of the different species. And rabbits really started to pique my interest. So I approached my department head and I said, okay, this is something that I've started to develop an interest in. Is this something we can do? And the answer I got was the bureaucratic political answer of, if you can make sure that it doesn't cost us any money and we don't have to do anything with it, go for it. Hmm. And so that was, that was what we started. So sometime around my second year here, I started putting together business plans on what could we do to bring a rabbitry to Tarleton State University. And John, I did the same thing you did. I looked up and said, how many universities have a rabbitry? Best of my knowledge, now at one time there were several. Best of my knowledge, there are either three or four in the nation right now, including us. One oh, is yeah. Kingsville, Texas. So Texas A&M Kingsville has one. Does Most Texas A&M not- Kingsville, don't they even have their own, don't they have their own specialty <laughs> breed or genetics? Is that correct? Is that right? That is. That is. Okay. They, um, they develop the Altex. So one of the professors down there, used to teach at Alabama A&M and then moved to Texas A&M Kingsville. So A-L-T-E-X, they put together the Altex breed. And apparently he got a little bored with that. They sold out of those. And then they developed the T-A-M-U-K line of New Zealand rabbits. So they're supposed to be a heat tolerant line of New Zealand's. That was kind of where I got my university rabbitry inspiration was Dr. Lucar down at A&M Kingsville. He had made it work successfully. Um, to my knowledge, there was a rabbitry at one of the universities in Ohio, Oregon State used to have one, but best of my contacts have been able to tell me they're out of it. So Tarleton, we've we've come into our own. We're kind of setting the stage because we're one of the last active rabbitries. Even Kingsville's rabbitry is no longer active in research and teaching. It just still exists. So we've, we've moved into the stage where we are we're the newest guy on the block, but we're also the last of the breed. We're, we're the last ones out there that are still doing this actively. So that's where we got the idea. We, that was where the idea was born. We wanted to establish rabbits as a species that we could use for teaching, for research, and for outreach. It was something that we could get students involved. We have a lot of students coming to the university now that are not from agricultural backgrounds. They're more from a, an urban or suburban area small animals don't scare them as much. So it's a way to ease them into the animal sciences before you throw them out there with hogs or with cattle. And it helps augment a different industry that the universities don't necessarily focus on. Now, one thing I was doing when I put together this presentation is the last thing I want you to do is think that I'm sitting in the ivory tower. And I know that's the view of a lot of college professors that we we teach from the ivory tower and we've got all the resources in the world. No, we, we started out like most of you start out. So we started out with nothing. The, like I said, when I approached the administration, the answer was, if you can do it without any cost, make it work. So we had a barn at Stephenville at the Ag Center that was not being used. It had been used for multiple things over the years. It had been a chicken barn. It had been a show hog barn. Most recently, it was storage. And so as I go through these next sets of pictures, you'll see a smaller image in the bottom. That's what we started out with. That, that's what that barn looked like when we got there. And it took me, my wife, and a group of very dedicated students over about the course of a month to clean out all the junk, all the rats, all the snakes, all the things that have been left over all these years and get us to something that was functional. So like I said, I, I show this to say we, we didn't start with 
of the brand new state of the art facility, we started with what we had. And I feel like, and the more I get to know rabbit producers around the state, and the more I talk to people that are in raising rabbits, it's how most everybody starts. You, you start small, you start with what you have, and you build up from there. And so that's, that's where we started. We started from nothing and we built up. So it came to, how do we put this together? I will say that I could not have done this if it hadn't been for the help of one of my students. There was a student here at Tarleton who had raised rabbits from down around the Houston area. And she and I partnered together. She had the expertise and I had the faculty position. So I did a lot of learning. Most of the beginning was all about learning. We did some things that weren't right. We did some things that were right. And we've changed a lot of things over the years. So, or over the past year, I should say. So this, this is what we did. We built it from scratch. We built it up. And John, I'm glad you brought up the A&M Kingsville line of rabbits because that's what we started with. So our first stock that I've got shown here, uh, my student and I loaded up about five o'clock in the morning one morning and made a day trip down to Kingsville. And we bought a set of rabbits, a set of six rabbits from them. And that's mm. where we got our start. Now, I'm here to say we don't own any of these animals anymore. We've only been in it a year. And these animals don't exist anymore because what we discovered was they didn't fit our system. But that's, that's one of the things that I'm kind of putting into this presentation is it's been a learning experience. It's not just me teaching students. The students are teaching me and a lot of folks like y'all are teaching me. You know, y'all have experience with this. Y'all been doing this a lot longer than I have. So yes, I may be at the university and I may be trying to, trying to improve and trying to augment and trying to help the association to help the breeds. But y'all are teaching me as much as I'm teaching you. So, you know, I show all this where we started from nothing. Where are we today? As of, I believe we're seven days ago, we've been in business a year. So it's been one year since we started this operation. Where are we today? We're officially recognized by the university. And so they created us our own logo logo and everything and if you've ever been around academia or any of that once they create you a logo they can't get rid of you it takes forever to go through a marketing process so if you make it through marketing you're set so you know we have a logo what are we at well that barn that you saw a minute ago that had all the junk piled up and we were doing good just to be able to see the concrete floor this is what it looked like at about noon today i wanted to get the most recent picture we had so this is what our facility looks like today now it looks different than some of your facilities. This was a learning experience for me. I was told when we started, hanging cages are the way to go. Well, I couldn't do hanging cages. I've got about a 25 foot ceiling and I didn't really have the right capacity to hang the cages. So I decided to put them on tables. What did I learn over the past year? Don't put a rabbit cage on a table. <laughs> That, that is the one thing that I have learned that we will never do again is don't build a table for a rabbit cage, but I don't, because I don't care how well you paint it, how well you seal it, it is going to ruin. So we're in the process within the next year, I hope those tables won't exist anymore. We'll be to stacking cages because another thing I learned is you can stack a lot more cages than you can put on tables. I've got a finite amount of room. So if I go to stack cages, I can get more in the barn. Um, we have our own processing room. So that's one thing that I had to do to get us in with what we need to do for the university is we're not able to sell all of our stock for show animals or for breeders. We'd love to, but we end up because we are a teaching facility, because we are generating these animals as a teaching experience, we end up breeding more than what are needed by our clientele. So I submitted paperwork last week to the state of Texas to get a poultry and rabbit exemption as long as cross my fingers, but as long as that goes all right, within the next month, we should be able to process on site. So that'll be another way for us to move animals. I what did is, make sure that we got registered. What is, oh, go ahead, John. What's your plan on, on how you're gonna, you gonna sell them? Or are you gonna sell them in your, the, for meet them locally? Or what is your hope? Yes, sir, that, that's the plan. So what we've been doing is the ones that did not go to breeders or to show animals we've been selling for meat but our limitation right now was i sell them the animal and then i'll deliver them to a processor for them well what i realized in a hurry is the processor not useful for them so i'm getting a little gouged on the prices 
because I have to, I sell them for a break even that I have to go get the processor. And by the time you end up with it, it's a little too expensive to get a rabbit carcass out to someone. So what we're hoping to do, and I've been talking with the meat inspectors and with the state is once I have the approval from the Department of Safety and Health Services or yeah, DSHS, what, whatever that acronym is, I'm still trying to remember all the acronyms, but as soon as I have their approval, I can vacuum seal and sell this meat out of our facility. Nice. So that's our hope. That's one of the, one of the next steps that we plan to take. And the one thing that I've really been dedicated to, or that I've really tried to be dedicated to is the fact that I need to make sure that we are associated with the people who are in the know. And that's why, you know, when I got this invitation, I jumped at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do it. And I got the chance and I thought that we were doing okay. I submit our paperwork to the ARBA to make sure that we are registered with them. Um, I don't try to force this operation or what we're doing on anyone. I want people to know that this is a resource that we're here and available because ultimately one of the biggest things is we're a teaching operation. We're here for teaching and that's what we were doing. This is when we were first starting. This is my research group. We bring them in and we try to teach and, and educate people on what it takes to to raise a rabbit. It takes to get into this business. What, what are some of the things that are needed and what are some of the things that we can do to serve the public? So John, when, when you asked me to put this together, it was kind of what is the Tarleton rabbit tree? What are we doing? And then it was rabbit 101. What does it take to care for a rabbit? So again, there are a lot of you that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. So instead of framing it as here are the ins and outs of what it takes to raise a rabbit where it sounds like I'm an expert. I kind of framed it more in um, things I picked up a lot. Um, one of the first things I'll tell you, and one of the things I've learned the hard way is good stock is hard to come by. And when you get it, make sure you keep it. So I told you that we started out with T-A-M-U-K -T New Zealand's. We drove down to Kingsville. We got theirs. What I come to realize is, yes, they did a very good job breeding those up. They bred them for a purpose, and that purpose was heat tolerance. But what they didn't pay attention to, and one thing that I realized is when it came to sir clientele of this area, those animals don't fit. Our clientele are the students that are showing in 4-H and FFA shows. They are the local breeders like yourselves that are also selling to the shows. It's people who are interested in those breeds. The TAMUKs do their job. They're heat tolerant. They can tolerate the heat of Kingsville, Texas very well. But when you hang that carcass, which is ultimately what those animals are for, even when it comes to the meat thins or the breeder shows, we're looking at how that animal conforms to the standard of meat. They're meat animals. We're looking at how they conform to what can they be delivered in a product. Those animals don't measure up. And that is my personal opinion, I've got nothing against King's Pool, nothing against what they do, but they don't meet what I would consider be the standards. Their, their frame is a little larger, but they've got a lot more skin, a lot more bone, and not as much meat on that frame. And from a science perspective, it makes sense. When you don't have as much muscle on the frame, you're not expending as much heat. It takes a lot of heat of digestion, a lot of heat of metabolism to maintain muscle. So what I realized when we got into those is they didn't meet what we needed. So what we've done is over the past year, we've worked with people like yourselves. You know, we started out with donations. We had some breeders in the area that donated animals to us to get us started. With those donated animals, we bred them up. We sold their offspring. The ones that worked for us that were doing really well, we kept. But what we also did is we used those animals, those kits that we sold off to generate enough revenue to buy more stock, so to upgrade our genetics, to get where we needed to be so that we're comparable to what you are doing so that when we start doing research, when we start trying to look at how to effectively raise rabbits, we're talking about apples and apples or oranges and oranges. We're not trying to compare apples to oranges. If we don't have the same type of stock that you do, then our work doesn't mean anything to you because we're not comparing on the same level. 
So that's really what we've done. And again, like I said, that whole concept of, you know, as long as it doesn't cost us money, everything that we bring in, in terms of our revenue, goes right back into the facility. Um, the only thing that we're supported by the university is they make sure that we have a student in place to help manage the facility. Everything else is if we sell it, it goes back into supporting the operation. So good stock is key. I've, I feel like we've moved in some good stock. So I, I ran the county show circuit this past year. I learned a lot about showing rabbits that I did not know at the time. I sat in the barn and I talked to folks. And, and that's, that's one thing that I've learned is a lot of people look for PhDs as the experts. And I think it's the other way around. The PhDs are just in an area where we can do something for you. You're the experts. You're the ones who know what's going on. And you're the ones that I need to learn from. I need to listen to you on what you've done and what's worked and what hasn't worked. And maybe I can put some science behind it and figure out why something didn't work or why something worked better. So that, that's one way that I approach things. And so the stock becomes a big deal. One of the things that I have focused on heavily, very heavily over the past year is climate control. And you know, you saw the barn, you saw the facility, and it's been, like I said, it's been a poultry barn, it's been a hog barn over the years. It's not HVAC controlled. It doesn't really have ventilation. It's a metal barn. It, it is a metal building. That's all it is. So when we started out, it's got window banks on each side. We get a lot of light coming in and a lot of heat coming in. So what we did for the most part is what you see here. Home Depot happened to be running a sale on no-name porticools, no-name uh, swamp coolers. That's where we put our investment. We had three swamp coolers running in the barn. And then what you'll notice if we go back several slides is we've got a lot of these box fans. So Walmart, we bought Walmart out in box fans and we ran porticools. And all we were doing was trying to get airflow. If we could get airflow, that's what we wanted to do. So that airflow has been key for us. One thing I realized and one thing that we've added in is if you notice this middle picture, I recently did a Google search for vinyl curtains, just outdoor or livestock barn curtains and found some fly-by-night website. So I say fly-by-night, they're actually pretty good. I've, I've been very appreciative, but covers for all. And we spent about uh, two or $300 and got white vinyl curtains to cover all of those windows. That's been a game changer for us. That little bit of change has made management of that barn in the middle of summertime a complete 180. You'll see here, I keep these big wall thermometers on the walls of the rabbitry. This time of year, last year, we were battling temperatures inside the barn pushing 90 because there was just no way to get the heat out. We could not get the heat out. Our breeding tank, about nearly zero. We were having no does take. Now, we've got 95 degree days. So when I walked in the barn and took this picture of the thermometer, it was about 93 degrees outside and we just had hit 80. So I mean, it, it was, to say comfortable may not be the exact term I would use, but relatively speaking, when it comes to livestock operation, 80 degrees inside a metal building in heading into July, I would consider to be decently comfortable. So climate control has been one thing that I've come to realize and come to appreciate and that's something that I, I'm kind of adding in in this Rabbit 101 system is we haven't done it in a way that would require you to go in and completely retrofit a barn. We didn't have the money for it. And I'm assuming, you know, if you're like me, you don't have the money for it either. We've put in very little investment, but it's those little things. It's, it's a, those little incremental changes that we've been able to put in that have changed our game. We've gone from, like I said, this time last year, our conception rates were close to none. If we bred 10 animals, we might expect one to take. Now we're breeding six animals on the first of every month. And I think in the past three months, one is missed. So, I mean, it, it's a big difference and it's changed how we operate. Part of that may be the stock. Part of it may be climate control, but it's all in that management aspect. It's all, all tied together. One thing I've learned a lot about, and, and this, this kind of ties into the rabbit production, it kind of does, it. I think it really does. Supplementary income. It, it, 
if it were up to us running this barn only on the rabbits we could sell, we would have gone under after about three months. So, you know, it, it just wasn't working. We don't have the year round demand for the animals we're producing. Like I said, we're initially a teaching unit. So if we're teaching, we understand that we're not going to be generating a lot of revenue, but that revenue has to be there to support us. The supplementary income has been a game changer for us. And one thing you'll notice, you know, these top two pictures, I'd say half of our sales over the past year has been compost. We sell composted rabbit manure. You know, if we go back and look at this picture of the stock, you'll notice all of my cages have durapans underneath. Now, from a management perspective, that becomes an issue. Those durapans, you've got to throw down shavings. You've got to keep them cleaned out. That's an ammonia issue in the barn. That's a manure management issue in the barn. What we did is we turned the sow's ear into a silk purse. So instead of having to go out to the manure spreader that the farm owns and dump these pans twice a week, we went to the local vet supply place that was selling those 55 gallon white barrels for a dollar a piece and we bought as many as we could fit. So, you know, by buying all those, we cut the tops off of them. Now we empty the pans into the barrels, drill a few holes in the bottom for drainage, set them outside beside the barn. Now we're generating compost. Doesn't really take a lot of extra effort on our part. We've got to clean those pans anyway. Now, from my perspective, I have students to help with this. So the labor doesn't become as much of an issue. And that may be a limiting factor when it comes to other operations. But it's allowed us to move into a different market. The people who may not have bought stock from us for breeding or may not have bought rabbits from us for show come spring gardening season, we've been selling compost by the 55-gallon barrel. So we've hit a different clientele and we've expanded the operation into something different. So we've taken a rabbit breeding operation, a breeding colony, and we've turned it into more of a holistic operation. We're kind of able to say that we're close to a zero waste facility because what waste we are generating, we're trying to move it into a different operation. And the other thing is what you were asking about earlier, John, the process. So, you know, a lot of operations are solely focused on, here's the breeding animal. Here's the best of what I've got. Well, yeah, I, I know enough about livestock that even if I'm breeding the best, I don't always have the best. There's always gonna be something out of the litter that just doesn't make the cut. You know, when I've got folks coming in for show season and looking at animals, I looked at one today. It's a good looking animal, one ear flops over. Well, that floppy ear is not gonna be the first one picked out of the litter. So by sending in that paperwork to the state, a four page document that all it requires is I've got a facility that I can make sure is sanitary. By doing that, I've moved into another operation. Somebody that may not want to raise rabbits is willing to come by and pay 20 or $25 for a whole rabbit to be able to put on the grill or put on the smoker. So that supplementary income has allowed us to one, look at the whole operation. Again, I'm teaching. So if I'm teaching students, it's not necessarily selling the best of my animals. It's how do I turn this operation into a holistic operation where I'm looking at all aspects. You know, by looking at the supplementary income, I'm taking into account that my, my number two animals or my second tier animals or my third tier animals still serve a purpose. My manure management plan is no longer an issue. It becomes a benefit. And that kind of rolls us into we've been able to tie in a marketing plan. And that's one of the things, like I said, I've taken this, what I've learned in raising rabbits, and I've learned that the actual raising of the rabbits is a small portion of raising rabbits. You know, what? once you kind of get that down, yes, there are gonna be some hiccups. The management side is gonna be hiccups, but there's a whole lot more to raising the animals than just raising the animals. So the marketing plan has been a big deal for us getting our name out, getting to the public. John, the same way you found us. The fact that we're on Facebook and you were able to contact us and shoot messages back and forth. That marketing plan has been big for us. Um, ag teachers become our big deal. So it, the whole, it's not what you know, it's who you know. We may not know the most about raising rabbits, but we know enough people that can put us in touch with enough people that it started to put us in a place where we can start serving the public. And that was one of the big things that we put together. Now that marketing plan 
ties into a social media plan. And that, that's again where we have a presence. Your Black Lamb Prairie group has done a good job of this. So y'all have a, a pretty decent presence. One thing we did is we tied in, we have a setting for every day of the week. Now, I will say during this past spring with all the different issues that popped up, we were not good about following this plan to the letter. So we've got to do some revamping for the fall, making sure we stay up on our posts. But it almost becomes a full-time job managing the social media presence of the barn. But by managing that social media presence and getting people that are following us, it's allowing us to get out there and talk about what we're doing, talking about what we can do for people and what we are doing for people. The biggest thing that I've seen, and you know, this is a big thing because we are a university and because we do have to maintain a certain set of standards, but it's one thing that I've been able to, to teach producers. One thing that I haven't seen as well is our record keeping. And I know producers keep records. So I, I know y'all keep records. You're breeding animals, you're selling animals, you have records. To what level do you have records? Uh, you know, do we go overkill here at the university? Probably. I, I won't say, I will say that we are probably overkill. Every animal in that barn is weighed once a week. So if they're a breeding animal, if they're a kit, if they were born today, they're weighed once a week. It allows us to track who's growing the fastest. Is there a certain combination of buck and doe that's producing the right litter? Every animal that comes through our barn has a birth weight. So the day they're born, they get put on a scale. I want to know how they're being born. I want to know how small that run is. You know, is that runt half the size of the rest of the litter? If so, it may not make it. Do I have a doe that's putting out? One thing that I noticed this year, we had a doe that was throwing animals so big, I'm fairly certain she ended up with dystocia. She was throwing kits that were two and a half ounces a piece. All the rest of my kits were throwing, or all the rest of my does were throwing kits at about an ounce and a half. It made for great pictures. It looked like we were raising monster babies, but it was overkill. Any of you that have been around the cattle business, it was kind of like putting a charlet on a heifer. You just don't do it. You know, they're a little too big. So those are things that we're following. We end up with health checks every week, and that has been a big thing for us. That is, we do that from the perspective of we have to follow university compliance. So I have to show that if something happens in the barn that I'm treating it. It was something that grew out of necessity, but we've turned it into something that we can use for teaching and for showing producers. So by putting every one of those does and uh, bucks through a health check every week, we catch things early. You know, things that might have grown into bigger issues, we catch really early. Ear mites, knock on wood, and I am knocking on wood for sure because that's something that could change tomorrow. But Ear mites have not become an issue in our barn because at the first sign, we've got it. We don't end up with a full infestation because we're inspecting those ears every seven days. So, you know, the first sign of a little crust, we know that we're catching it. Hernias, before they become an issue and we end up with an animal that might die from it, we can tell when it's a small button. Uh, teeth especially, when we end up with malocclusions. Malocclusions seem to be the one thing that we battle the most. We can start to see when those teeth just start to start crossing. You know, they don't have to get fully out of line. We can catch them early enough that we clip them. And before they have to be ground down, we've corrected that issue. You know, we've got breeding and kindling records. The standard in the barn right now is they've got three shots. And that's something that I brought from the cattle world over into this is if she's been put with a buck three times and she didn't have a litter, she's gone. She's of no use to me. The answer I give my student that helps me manage the barn is she's not earning her keep. She, she's not paying her way. And I can't afford to keep paying an animal that didn't pay her way. So, you know, that, that's really the overview of what we do, things that I picked up along the way. The reason I started it was from a research perspective. I was really curious. I love to compare species. And I was really curious about what could we do in terms of rabbit research. If you search the papers, so I, again, I'm an academic. I, I search the journals. Most of the information that we know about rabbits, almost everything that we know in terms of what works, what doesn't work, came from Europe. It comes from the uh, Spanish. It comes from the French. It comes from the Swedish. 
very little of that research has been done in the U.S. So does it hold up? Are we doing something original or are we going to win the Nobel Prize? No, I, I like to take what one of my professors said in undergrad. The only way I'm getting a trip to Switzerland is if I buy a ticket. They're not calling me for the Nobel ceremony anytime soon. We're repeating research that's already been done. Uh, you know, we're starting some research this fall. I've got a student that's looking into artificial insemination of rabbits. They've already investigated a lot of that in Europe. What we are doing though, is there's a lot of difference in what happens in continental Europe and what happens in America. There's difference in climate, there's a difference in species, there's a difference in management techniques. So what we're trying to do is take that research that's been done, move it over to the US and see, does it still hold true? So we're here for you. And that's, that's kind of where I'm moving to the questions section of this presentation is the whole purpose of this operation, we don't exist in a bubble. We don't exist just for the students to learn about rabbits, just for the students to learn about livestock production. We don't exist just so I can publish some research papers. One of the ways that I sold this plan to the university was, I want to serve you. If the ARBA or the Black Lion Prairie Rabbit Breeder Association or the Texas Rabbit Breeder Association has a burning question, y'all contact me. I, you know, Like I said in the very beginning, I'm not Dr. Smith, I'm Brandon reach out to me, ask me the question. If there's something we can do to help or something we can investigate that's going to help you, that's what we're here for. That's why we're one of the last remaining rabbitries in the nation, the newest and the last. Brandon, fantastic. That's uh, very cool. That is very, very cool. So gang, everybody that's here, do you have any, do you have any questions for Brandon? Anything that uh, you'd like to maybe comment or any questions on, their, on what they're doing? Oh, I think you're still muted, Tammy. <laughs> Just curious, are you going to vaccinate your rabbits for the VHD? We plan to. So I, I have been following that one really closely. I try to use our Facebook page to put out anything I see ARBA or Texas Department of uh, Texas Department of Parks and Wildlife. I try to put it out. Um, we work with a veterinarian in town. As y'all well know, it's hard to find a veterinarian that works on rabbits. So we have an equine guy that we work with, but I have not contacted him yet. I've been following the post on, is the vaccine gonna be available? How is it gonna be available? Within the next month, I plan on reaching out to him and if he can get access to it, yes, I plan for us to vaccinate. It's some scary stuff. I've seen what, I worked with a vet when I was in College Station that followed the, uh, the hemorrhagic disease in cattle, so the equivalent disease in cattle, it, it's some scary stuff. So yes, I, I am a believer in vaccines and I am going to try my best to make sure our herd doesn't take it in. What is your Facebook page? Our Facebook page is Tarleton Rabbitry. So at Tarleton Rabbitry. Dr. Smith, you probably saw me taking pictures of the screen, so I hope it didn't look too creepy. Um, I'm a 4-H leader. So oh, okay. I have a, a large 4-H um, group of kids that show quite a bit. Okay. Um, and I loved all this stuff because this is what they do. They keep binders. They weigh. They um, have to give me weight logs every week. And okay. so when we meet, they need, I need to be able to ask them, you know, how many in your litter, what do they weigh? Where, and we start weighing as we get closer to show. Um, this is really, really good for these kids to um, realize because you can't, you don't know if you're being successful if you don't where your starting point was when you started your research. You don't have a comparison. Sure. So when these kids are taking classes with you, what classes are they enrolled in in college? Um, right this second, they're not enrolled in classes that focus on the rabbitry. So right now it's student volunteers. Um, okay. we, we discussed the addition of something like a... Um, a rabbit production class. The only limitation that we had was truly my teaching time. I was already enrolled in or already committed to teaching too many classes and my department head said I couldn't add another class. So that was the limitation there. Um, what we've done is we've, we've advertised through stuff like Facebook and all and any student that's been interested, we've brought them in and it's student volunteers so they don't have to be enrolled. I have taken on students uh, most of our students are required to do an internship. 
So I've taken on student interns and uh, let them do their internship as barn management. And we go through a lot of these things. So different ways that we can get around it. So Brandon, I had a question about um, your uh, compost. Okay. What, is, what are you using for litter? And then how are you treating the compost? Are you doing anything to it prior to uh, you know, someone purchasing it? Tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so what we're all, what our litter is is I go to Tractor Supply and buy their pelleted horse shavings. So it was it was the cheapest thing I could find that fit in the uh, bins. And like I said, I I feel I feel like I can I can talk on the level with everybody because we're not buying a lot of things that are very pricey or very fancy. It's pelleted horse shavings, five ninety five a bag, and if they run them two for ten, I buy an extra load. <laughs> so uh, that's what we're using. I put a few scoops in there. We do a full clean out of those trays once a week and kind of spot clean them the rest of the time. Uh, I played around with treatments. So we had some compost tumblers to begin with. I got some miracle Grow tumblers. I realized we were generating too much litter for the tumblers. I was spending more money on tumblers than I cared to do. So that's when we went to the barrels. I tried some compost starter. I realized that there really wasn't much difference. So what we're doing is the pelleted shavings are enough to capture the urine and the urine's where most of the nitrogen is. And then the fact that you've got the wood chips in there gives you the carbon. It's all, the composting is all about the carbon nitrogen ratios. You don't want too much nitrogen or it's going to spoil too much carbon and it's just going to sit there and look pretty. So it's all about balancing those two things. What I've learned is the pellets are dry enough that they contribute some carbon with the wood chips. The urine is really what drives the system. And as long as I can keep, what I ended up doing is going on Amazon and buying one of those pigtail turners. Looks like a big, the old style drills. Mm -hmm. And I just keep it turned in that barrel. And then it depends on time of year. So during the summer, it may sit four weeks and it's cooked and ready to go. During the winter time, it usually sits there for about four months. But we just keep an eye on it. When it starts changing color, we'll use that uh, long probe temperature. And when it starts getting back to ambient temp, that's how we treat it. We just let it sit there and let the flies lay their eggs in there. When I see maggots, that's a good thing. I, I don't get rid of them. That, that's what I need to keep, keep turning it and breaking it down. The, thankfully, I put them outside the barn. So we have fly traps inside the barn, flies at the compost bin. Same thing I do at my house. When the flies get out of place, they die. As long as they stay and do their job, I'm okay with them. When they get out of place, they're now a nuisance. <laughs> so in the summer, you Oh, you ahead, said in the summer it takes about four weeks and then it's ready to go. And then who are your buyers and what are they using it for? Uh, my buyers, like I said, I advertise through Facebook. Most of them are gardeners. Uh, one, of the, one of the few benefits to COVID and people working from home is people started gardens this year. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we went, we were loading up barrels at a time. Uh, we, we ended up, and I've always done bulk discounts. We used to bag them up in smaller bags and then we moved to, okay, if you buy some bags and then it was, if you need a barrel, but it was volume discounts. And we were, we had folks come in and we were loading up two and three barrels for them. So it was just word of mouth and advertising. Uh, we talked to the master gardeners. We talked to people that were starting gardens. It becomes a seasonal thing. And yes, man, it can be anywhere from four weeks to four months. It's really time of year heat. Heat does really good for us. You know, June, July, we can turn compost real quick. Uh, winter time, it sits there. Yeah. Thank you. That was very helpful. What do you do for indoor fly control? Indoor fly control, the best thing I have found is, again, tractor supply. And I promise I'm not advertising for anybody. It's just what I find. Um, tractor supply has this roll. It's about that long. So we tried the regular old fly strips that you've seen in barns all your life. And they didn't work. They're a little too sticky. They gummed up my walls. And we spent a lot of time painting those walls. I didn't want gum on them. Um, but they make a roll about that long. And it's got 30 foot of sticky tape on it. And we'll roll out about a foot of time. It's yellow. It has a picture of the flies on it. But if you'll roll those out, that has been the best thing because it's big enough to attract them and has enough on the roll that it's good for the money. So it cost us, you know, about eight dollars a roll. But I keep about four or five of those in the barn. And since we have those tables, I'll tack them to the legs. 
And as long as I keep those in different areas of the barn and usually one on the window, it keeps the flies down pretty well. So thankfully, cross, cross my fingers, I haven't had to do a lot of fly spraying. I had a question. I may have missed it, but did you, what do you use for a watering system? Ah, watering system, that is, that's one of my pride and joy. So you didn't miss it. I didn't talk about it. So that's, okay, that's, I didn't think I did. That's my bad. Um, we actually use a water nipple system. So we use a water hose and water nipple. And what I did is we had a single faucet in the barn. So I went and got one of the four-way splitters that you can pick up at any of the hardware stores ran a four-way splitter and then a little uh, foot and a half jumper hose. And we ended up ordering our water system through KW Cages. We got their um, system. They've got a regulator that dials mm -hmm. down the pressure. So I think the pressure coming out of the hose is around 30 PSI. Our regulator drops it down to about three PSI. And then we got, I think we ended up with a three eighths inch hose that we ran through the barn and just ran tees down all of our lines of cages to the automatic water nipples. We tried bowls for a little while and the rabbits yeah. were a little too curious. We ended up with a lot of overturned bowls and a lot of nobody with water. Yeah. Like everybody's it smiling because a lot of people have dealt with that just like you did, right? And every, you know, it's the same kind of system. So, yep. <laughs> so I, uh, I swear by that system. The only time that we have an issue is we are on well water at the farm. So about three times in the past year, I get a phone call that says the well, the pump's out. And that's why I keep, so the, um, you know, you go to Walmart or Ace and they've got the big water cooler jugs. I keep two of those on hand in the barn so that if the well ever goes out, I've got fresh filtered water in those water coolers that we can then put into bowls. So I've got a backup system if needed, but I try to avoid it. Correct. Cool. Okay. How many rabbits do you currently have in your rabbit tree? So we were set up initially to handle 12 does and six bucks. And the plan was to start there and grow. You know, as we cycled out from single row cages to stacks, we could grow as needed. Right now, between does, bucks, and kits, I believe our last count on inventory was 101. So our, we finally got into a system. And our system fits most of the shows for our clientele, but we breed half of our does on the first of every month. And that means that we're, our kindling is usually, we usually have some go on 31, but most of ours are on day 32. But we, um, if we breed on first of the month, then we have kits around the second or third of the month and we go on a 28 day weaning. So if we wean at 28 days, then Half are getting weaned and half are being born at any given month. Keeps us in the cycle where we've got enough animals at all stages. Can you talk a little bit about what you're feeding and why, and then does that change um, over the, the rabbit's uh, lifespan or time of year? Sure. Um, what we are feeding is petrus. So we actually contacted uh, Joel and Jane Petrus, and they have been supplying us with feed for the barn. Uh, why we did that, I, honestly, I asked around. I asked folks what they were feeding, what their experiences had been, what did they like, what did they not like. All of our rabbits came in, they had been on different feeds. So we fed a little of everything. We fed some, we fed ADM, we fed, oh Lord. I, We've kept a bag of something in the barn at all times because we've had to transition them all. Um, like I said, most of that was word of mouth. It was just, that was what I was told by some folks and we've had good luck with it. We don't change our feed based on stage of life. What we ended up with is by feeding the Petra 700 C and like I said, by training, I'm a nutritionist. So that was my most fun part was examining all the feeds and seeing what we could do. By using the 700C, it's got enough fiber and enough protein that it hits all of our life stages without having to change. The only thing we change is the amount. So our, uh, our bucks stay on about four ounces a day, and we, we have a scale on the bar. We weigh out feed every day. So instead of it being volumetric, we're actually doing weights. So they're on about four ounces a day. Our does, when they're 
pregnant are between six and eight ounces. When they have kits, they go up. And when the kits start eating feed, it's everything they want. Um, we stuck with that. And the reason I haven't changed and tried different ones is because I am a nutritionist. That's one of the things that I want to start our research on is uh, <laughs> changing feed ingredients. I've got a colleague here at the university that wants to examine forage fed rabbits. He, he's an agronomist like one. He's really curious about growing forage on site to feed the rabbits. So that's one thing that we're gonna move into is trying to do some feed replacement with grasses. Uh, my experience with peaches, I've liked it. The pellets are the right size. The pellets are what we needed, and we're not dealing with a lot of fines. Uh, one thing that I ended up with when I tried some different feeds is, I don't know if it was how long the bag had set on the shelf or just that particular run, but we ended up with a lot of fines. And those fines would be fine if we had solid bottom feeders, but I ended up with those sift feeders that sift out those fines. So I was weighing out feed, and I knew how much I was feeding because I was trying to calculate conversion ratios, and I was losing most of it to the table. And I, that was the one thing that I couldn't say I was losing a lot of that feed and missing my conversion ratio. What percent of protein is that, 700C? So I, I will say that I don't represent any feed company. I don't subscribe to any particular feed. That's just been our experience. Mm -hmm. I don't think he heard you ask about the protein. How much protein? Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, our protein is running 16%. So we're kind of in that mid-range. We, we, I know on those, breeding <clears throat> does, a lot of people will jump up to somewhere around at 18. I can see some benefits to it. I mean, I'm sure our animals are protein deficient at some stage of production, but by keeping them on that, on that e, I haven't run into any issues. Like you, know, knock on wood, I haven't run into those issues. Do you feed hay? So we've gone, we've gone as fails. I like to feed hay, and I'll usually just you know whatever the feed store has at the time. Usually just a Bermuda grass base. I don't go into the alfalfa because I don't want to overload the protein. The the one thing that I don't want to do is overshoot protein. I'd rather be under than over. Um. So we do Bermuda grass hay. What I have is most of my parents, my students, they collect toilet paper rolls and we'll yeah. stuff the hay in the toilet paper roll and it gives a little enrichment. They like to play around with it and it makes yeah. sure that the hay doesn't go everywhere. The one thing that I found and why we kind of go from yes we do, no we don't, depending on time of year, is that I ended up with a lot of allergy issues out of the kits. The hay would end up poking at the eye or the seed would end up poking at the eye, the dust. And we ended up with a lot of them that would have weepy eyes. And so to avoid that, I kind of will go from yes, no, yes, no. So sometimes we feed hay, sometimes we don't. Depends on what conditions we're seeing in the barn. And if we, a lot of times I'll examine the manure. You know, if we're not having pellets like I want to see, hay goes back in the ration. What about your nest boxes? Nest boxes, yes, we do have hay. So in okay. nest boxes, um, Again, we bought from KW, and this was just my experience. We did the metal nest boxes, mm -hmm. and I, I've talked to people. Some people love them. Some people hate them. What I liked is when we get done with the metal nest box, I can sanitize it down very well like I can't do with wood. So now heat in the summertime, we try to control that by how much fuel we put in. So what I'll do is the bottom uh, third to half of the nest box, we'll use fine flake shavings. So instead of the pelleted, we'll go to the flakes. And then on top of that, we'll put the hay in. Okay. Now, I could be wrong on that. Y'all may actually have a better way of doing it. That's just the way we've approached it. That's how I do it. <laughs> okay. Yep. I don't know about anybody else. I, I'll, like I said, I'm not going to claim to be an expert. I'll just tell you what I've done and what will work and what had not worked for us. I do something similar, Brandon, but um, since I, I use the pelleted uh, litter too, because for me, it's just easier. I can scoop it okay. instead of having to use my hands to lift out the shavings. It's just faster to me to fill the pans. Okay. And so, um, so when I do my nest boxes, I'll just get some of that pelleted litter and just wet it and let, okay. it, let, it, let it dissolve a little and then, um, and then dry out. And then that's what I put in the bottom of my nest boxes. So okay. it's like, like it sawdust. And we hadn't, we haven't really tried that. Um, yeah. we, we ended up 
again, my naivety. I went and bought a bag of pellet shavings and a bag of flake shavings, and yeah. we didn't know what to do with it, so we put the flake shavings in a bin, and that's what we use for nest boxes. And so far, it's worked. Uh, you know, I've got some overzealous does that'll dig all the way down to the metal pan at the bottom. They'll dig all the shavings out. I'm not sure I could eliminate that no matter what I put in. I'm not sure I could put concrete in there, and they wouldn't dig. <laughs> I've got some that don't want to dig a hole at all. So, yeah, you got to love animals. They they won't give you something consistent. <laughs> Well, I've, had, were, I've had good luck with um, Carefresh. Carefresh, okay. I have seen that. I have, I have heard of that. What is, Any what particular is reason for the Carefresh? Um, I don't think it binds up as much as the shavings. Okay. And it, it's a little softer when the does jump in. They don't smash the kits as bad. Okay. Yeah, I have had an issue with that. I, I've got some does that don't watch where their feet go, so I end up losing some kits. But I will say, our death loss this past year, I was very impressed. You know, for a litter-bearing animal, our death loss over the course of a year ran about 10%. So I, I was very pleased. Well, gang, we're about at uh, the top of the hour here. Um, any any final questions for Brandon before we uh, before we depart? General question, John: Are these being recorded? Because these are really the 4-H kids and the FFA kids. This is this is good stuff for them. Yeah, Tammy's uh, Tammy's recording it right now. So Tammy, awesome. will we post can we post the link of the recording too? Is that yes? As soon as I figure out where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> How to find it when I'm done. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll get it posted on our site for sure. And, and Lori, feel free to reach out to me. If there's anything I can do for your 4-H group or your FFA group, I'll be happy to do something just for them. I mean, I'm I'm happy to do whatever I need to. You know, if, whatever whatever will benefit this group, I'm here to do it. You know, if that means me driving over and looking at rabbit trees, sitting down in a room and talking to folks, doing a webinar or whatever I need to do. Well, it's really, it's interesting because what you were talking about is what, what you have to learn when you start is you're going to start out with something and that you have to learn how to shift on the fly. This is working. That's not working. How do I adjust, you know, and not get frustrated. You just learn <laughs> from it and you make it better, but don't get frustrated. <laughs> well, see, I just, I made sure that I left all the frustration out of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Are you at the rabbit tree certain hours of the day? Um, kind of. So the rabbit tree is at our college farm. So I'm on campus. I go out to the farm. My student is there more than I am. So I was told by my department head and by all of them that I was not allowed to hide at the barn. So he monitors how often I go to the barn to hide from all the rest of my responsibilities. But a lot of it is... We're there sporadically during the day, but if we have somebody reach out to us, we make sure we're there to meet everybody. I was in Zevenville today is when I was asking. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, anytime you're coming by, you just shoot a message. I'll be happy to meet you out there and show you everything. I didn't know you were there. <laughs> I got you. Well, right right now we don't have a big sign. It says Livestock Center, but I'm I'm working on if I can kind of go around marketing a little bit. Well, I shouldn't say that. This is being recorded. Not go around marketing. What I'm trying to work on is getting a sign made that we can put up so that it's a little more prominent that says Tarleton Rabbit Tree that has that big logo there. But right now it says Livestock Center, and there's a itty bitty purple sign that says Welcome to the Bunny Barn. <laughs> Well, Brandon, this has been uh, this has been really nice. I mean, I really, really appreciate uh, uh, you know just like real world plus some research. I mean, it's pretty pretty cool stuff what you're doing there. Um, and and I, on behalf of our group, I thank you. Right, so um, it's really really nice of you. And and we will lean on you. Yeah, you asked about you know um, relationship with some of those ag teachers and 4-H groups. Uh, you know, we'd like to to you know, kind of work together on that kind of stuff. So thank that you. That sounds great. Anything I can do to help. And you're welcome to lean on us if you need anything. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. All right, gang. Uh, this is uh, the first one down. So great, uh, great to have everybody uh, together. So good deal. We'll uh, 
next week. And Brandon, we're going to have another one next week. And that one's going to focus on biosecurity, right? So uh, very good. And brought up the RHDV2 earlier. And, uh, you know, that's something we're going to focus on next, uh, next Tuesday night. All right. Very good. I'll make sure to be here. Hey, do. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank All right, you. everybody. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.